Your Excellency, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. A constructive relationship between Australia and Indonesia is indispensable. It is, as the late distinguished Australian diplomat Alan Renouf once remarked, the crucible of Australia's foreign policy. Few countries are more important to Australia than Indonesia. Its fortunes over the coming decades will impact on Australia's future prosperity and security as well as determine our broader role in the region. The Liberal Party values Indonesia's close friendship and we are committed to a strong, democratic and outward-looking Indonesia. In particular, its continued regional leadership is needed if we are to collectively overcome many of the challenges now before us. Our party has a long history of positive engagement with the government of Indonesia and its people. It is a relationship forged in the days of Menzies, Barwick and Hasluck, three great stalwarts of the liberal philosophical tradition. For Sir Robert Menzies, it was a paramount necessity that Australia and Indonesia coexisted as good neighbours. Under his leadership, Australia co-sponsored Indonesia's membership of the United Nations in 1950 and dispatched the Minister for External Affairs to make Australia's first official visit to Indonesia. He was later supported by Sir Garfield Barwick, who, as Minister for External Affairs, saw the need to develop friendly and cooperative relations with Indonesia at a time of immense change in the region. Decades on, at the height of the Asian financial crisis, it was Prime Minister Howard and Treasurer Costello who advocated Indonesia's interests to those overseas who had called for counterproductive austerity measures. Leadership of this nature is once again needed. The opportunity costs associated with the government's hastily announced Asia-Pacific community, its ill-conceived idea for a refugee processing centre on East Timor, its highly contentious asylum seeker swap deal with Malaysia and its mismanagement of Australia's live cattle trade are considerable. In each instance, there was not the courtesy that I would expect would be shown to our close neighbour by taking Indonesia into the government's confidence before these announcements, all of which affect Indonesia, were made. The fact that Australian and Indonesian officials first heard about the government's ban on exports from Radio Australia rather than from the government, as asserted by Richard Walcott, a former secretary of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, defies belief. Rather than working patiently and respectfully behind the scenes, this government has shown a propensity to rush policy announcements that impact upon the interests of our close friends and partners in the region. I work on the no surprises theory when it comes to our close friend in Indonesia. Australia's interests are best served when we work closely with partner countries to deliver mutually beneficial outcomes. This is the case for a range of issues from counter-terrorism to people smuggling to building stronger regional institutions. Australia's relationship with Indonesia is approaching a crucial juncture in our shared history. It is my view that we cannot allow any of the current issues between us to impact on the overall relationship, nor can we assume that the government's approach has gone unnoticed in Jakarta. I thank the Ambassador personally for his gracious, measured and positive approach at this time. A reinvigorated agenda is needed to deal with a different and contemporary set of issues and priorities. And as the Shadow Foreign Minister, I want to learn and understand more about what Indonesia sees as the future of our relationship and what Indonesia believes needs to be done to elevate it. I'm devoting much of my time in developing the coalition's foreign policy to Indonesia as I can think of few countries more deserving of our focus. In this ever-changing strategic environment we must be aware that some of the issues that have shaped the course of the relationship up to this point will no longer hold the same level of significance as they once did. This shift is being driven by a changing balance of power in the region as countries such as China and India and of course Indonesia continue their remarkable economic re-emergence.
For Indonesia, the strength of its economy is even more significant because of the distance it has travelled since the economic crisis of the late 1990s. According to Michael Wesley, in his recent publication, There Goes the Neighbourhood, quote, in the year after the crisis hit, the economy halved in size and the rupiah was devalued by 500% against the American dollar. Unemployment <coughs> and poverty rates doubled. Since then, Indonesia has enjoyed a decade of sustained growth. Its economy is now twice the size of its pre-crisis peak, with the wealth of its citizens doubling over this period. International monetary fund figures show that Indonesian gross domestic product is now greater than Australia's based on purchasing power parity. Having set the goal of 7 to 9% economic growth per year, Indonesia aims to become a developed country by 2025 and one of the 10 major global economies. For Australia, managing the changes that are now underway will require that we look at new ways to strengthen our bilateral relationship. The coalition believes that working closely with the Indonesian government to identify areas where closer engagement can be achieved is a foreign policy imperative. I'm firmly of the view that our relationship must be elevated across the board with special emphasis given to improving the level of understanding and interaction that exists at a person-to-person -person level between our two countries. The importance of building up these networks was recognised in the Joint Declaration on Comprehensive Partnership between Australia and the Republic of Indonesia, signed under the Howard Government as the foundation of our relationship. While the relationship has changed over the years, many of the negative stereotypes that impede closer engagement have not. This disappointing reality was captured by the Lowy Institute in its recent 2011 survey on public opinion and foreign policy. According to the Institute, those surveyed were lukewarm in their feelings towards our neighbour. Quote, little to no progress has been made convincing Australians to look more positively at Indonesia. These findings mirrored similar sentiments among Indonesians towards Australia. The poor level of understanding that exists between our two countries was raised by President Yudhiono during a meeting I had with him during his visit here in 2010. According to the President, many Indonesians have little knowledge of Australia outside of the basic, often negative, stereotypes. Similarly, many Australians have far too little knowledge of our important neighbour other than the misleading stereotypes. Indonesia is at an exciting time in its development. It has made great, pain, great gains in recent years in governance and political reform. Since 2005, Indonesia has held more than 600 direct local elections. The 2009 presidential election involved 174 million voters, 625,000 polling stations and 38 national political parties. The World Bank has labelled Indonesia the election capital of the world. The success of its democratic transition has been a beacon of light to the people of the Middle East and North Africa as they emerge from the shadow of political oppression. And I believe that this is a role that will fit Indonesia well in the years ahead. Indonesia's ability to integrate different actors and strands of thought into its political system has led many, including former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, to hold it up to the Middle East as an example worthy of emulation. More than a decade on from the dawn of its reformasi period, Indonesia is a vibrant, multi-party democracy with a flourishing civil society. The Indonesian government, under the leadership of President Yudhoyono, has sought to lead the region on issues of democracy and human rights. It was Indonesia that insisted a commitment to democracy and human rights be included in the new ASEAN Charter. It was Indonesia that took a lead role in establishing the Bali Democracy Forum as a space for countries to share their experiences and learn from best practice. As chair of ASEAN, Indonesia has also played an important leadership role in promoting peace and stability in the region. Its efforts to bring Cambodia and Thailand together to ease ongoing tensions are to be commended.